showtime for the second time today. Microphones working in both areas for the recorder and for the thing. So let's uh, say start broadcast. Show my screen and start broadcast. And we can start cooking now. Microphones working in both areas. Actually, there's 14 people that are still here. That's really nice. Okay. Uh, for those of you that are st here, can you hear me? Can the uh, buzzards hear me? Yes, they can. Okay, Mario, let's uh, start up with this. Sorry for the delay. I mean, I have nightmares about stuff like this. I, uh, you know, I, I don't have nightmares about looking stupid or not knowing what to say, but I do have nightmares about the technology failing. So. Up here, you could see the in the upper left. You could make it bigger now if you want. You can see the chief cells and the oxyphil cells in the northeast. You could also see the fat. You know that the chief cells are basically the producers of the uh, hormone. The oxyphil cells are some of the redder cells you see there on the right. And if you want to zip up the thyroid image, you could probably look at a couple of uh, uh, interfollicular cells or C cells or light cells knowing that those are going to be the producers of the calcitonin. Our bone physiology is basically a delicate homeostatic balance between the oxyphils and the uh, interfollicular or parafollicular cells. Okay, and uh, do the uh, last thing, do the bone, blow that one up a little bit. And remember, it's the osteoclast is being stimulated by the parathyroid hormone and the osteo to uh, uh, put calcium into the blood when that level gets uh, out of kilt and the osteoblasts are being stimulated by the um, calcitonin to put the calcium back in. Okay, get uh, next slide. Just keep that junk there. So what are the parathyroid disorders? Basically, they're the same as orders, disorders of calcium, aren't they? So hyperparathyroidism and all of its uh, uh, clinical findings and effects and pathologic features is the same as hypercalcemia. Uh, and hypoparathyroidism is generally synonymous with hypocalcemia. And the most common cause, two most common causes for hyper functioning of the parathyroid glands, not only hyperfunctioning but enlargement as well, would be a parathyroid adenoma that's functional. It's going to look primarily like chief cells. But also, if you remember from your renal physiology, is that with hypocalcemia being one of the most consistent findings of renal failure, just like hyperkalemia is, that's also going to be triggering off the uh, calcitonin to make more, I'm sorry, triggering off the parathyroid hormone to make more. So it's what we call like a secondary or reactive. And uh, the most common cause of hypoparathyroidism or hypocalcemia, resulting hypocalcemia, would be surgical diseases, a lot of some congenital and familial, and of course the ones we don't know about idiopathic. But I want to tell you that a lot of times when they do thyroid surgery, the surgeon's two greatest fears are number one, snipping the recurrent laryngeal nerve and making the patient hoarse or voiceless. But the other big concern is that they are going to be also removing the parathyroid glands. Because you could live without a thyroid gland because you just take thyroid hormone every day, but you can't live without a parathyroid gland. It would be fatal. So even though in the anatomy books, if you're looking at the posterior part of the thyroid, you're going to see a couple little things. It doesn't really work out that way. And very often, uh, the surgeon will not always be 100% sure if he's identifying parathyroid or not. So what he asks us to do is he might take a very tiny piece of it and ask the pathologist to identify is this parathyroid tissue or not. And if it is, then he leaves it in. Or sometimes what they can also do is to take out the thyroid and when they have identified parathyroid in it, they can just transplant it under the skin again. That's very often done. I don't know which is more common. Uh, and then there's something called pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And that's not so much due to a lack of parathyroid hormone, 
but it's due to a lack of uh, an increase in resistance to parathyroid hormone. Now, what is that sounding like? Isn't that sounding like diabetes mellitus? They say that type 2 adult onset diabetes is not necessarily at the beginning a decrease of insulin, but it's an, in, due to an increase of insulin resistance. Think of it that way. Next one. Okay, what would happen if you have hyperparathyroidism is the same question is what would happen if you had hypercalcemia? So most of these uh, findings, clinical or pathologic, are due to the fact that you just have too much calcium. The bones become too brittle, there's fractures. That calcium can plate out in the kidneys to form calcium renal stones. In fact, think about it. I told you that calcium stones of the gallbladder are relatively rare, or not rare, but maybe only 10%. But if a person with hyperparathyroidism uh, gets a gallbladder stone, it's very likely to be a calcium stone rather than a bilirubin stone or a, a cholesterol stone. Hyperparathyroid people become constipated. They get ulcers. They get gallstones. And you know what kind they'd be more likely to get. General clinical things are dep depression and lethargy. So when you go into your classical a scenario of classical presentation scenarios, you're gonna not, you're, on your board question. You're gonna see something somebody that comes in with depression and lethargy, and you go, "Oh my God, isn't that the differential diagnosis of just about every disease known to man?" Well, it's very very big with hyperparathyroidism, weakness, fatigue. For those of you that are big uh, uh, EKG pers people, I'm not an EKG person, but I want you to blow up that little segment there. I want to tell you that people with hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, that QRS interval, if you measure it on your, you know, the millimeter thing on your sheet, it's shorter than it should be. But the whole QT segment, I'm sorry, the T wave is widened. That's a really big T wave. You see, big T waves think hypercalcemia. Uh, I don't know the actual physiology between the calcium and why this happens, but uh, think big T waves, think big calcium. Next one. What about hypo? What about the other side? Well, neuromuscular irritability. And whereas uh, they can get a mental status change, well, you know, isn't that where so many diseases? They can have Parkinsonism-like effects. So when you think of somebody with all of the classical Parkinsonism, like says, you know, cogwheel, rigidity, and intention tremor, and stuff like that, think that maybe, don't always think central nervous system, check their calcium level, could be too low. And here's a paradoxical thing. Whereas, when we talked about the effects of hypercalcemia resulting in calcifications of everywhere, you would think that hypocalcemia would be lack of calcification. But the paradoxical thing is that in hypocalcemia, hypoparathyroidism, they still get a lot of calcification in their lenses. OK, now let's look at the EKG now. The two things to look for are a widened QT interval. You see that long area starts at the Q and ends at the T. That's longer than it should be. And uh, that's the big thing, widen QT. And think about it. What happens if you don't have enough calcium in your teeth? Well, they're more likely to become carious, uh, defective cavities, OK? So these are all the typical things of hypoparathyroidism, not enough calcium. Next one. OK, we're done with parathyroid. I was hoping to, we will finish adrenal today. There's absolutely no doubt, OK? Maybe we should kind of take a breath and kind of not be upset anymore about the delay we had. But uh, we're going to do adrenal in a very organized fashion. And uh, it's not going to take nearly as long as thyroid. And we'll be out of here, hopefully, uh, in a half hour. By the way, Buzzards, can you hear me well again, for those of you that are, were able to come back? Yes, good. Can you see well again after our computer disaster? Good. Uh, I want to tell you a really cool thing about the adrenal cortex now. We're going to talk about the adrenal cortex.
endocrine gland rather than the adrenal medulla first. There are two glands, just like anterior and posterior pituitary. One's basically neurologic, the other one is glandular. The adrenals theoretically are on top of the kidneys, right? So you think, well, in, in, on the anatomy books they are, but for those of you who have been to anatomy lab, you probably rarely saw them sitting right on top of the upper poles of the kidneys. Usually they're lateral or plastered around the uh, inferior vena cava. Uh, surgeons will tell you that they're never where they should be, and they have to look around for them, but they're always surrounded by a lot of fat. Well, what does the kidney do? The kidney has glomerular filtration rates, right? That's GFR. Well, the adrenals now are also GFR, because if you look at the layers of the cortex, it's GFR, going from capsule to medulla. Glomerulosa, which is, looks like little glomeruli from a kidney. Then fasciculata, which is the biggest, thickest, longest layer, and those are fascicles. And a fascicle is a linear arrangement of material, like, like matted straw or palm leaves or something like that. And then in a more nonlinear fashion, but not glomeruloid, more of a reticulated pattern is the reticularis. So GFR, glomerulosa, reti uh, fasciculata, reticularis. What does glomerulosa make? The mineralocorticoids, the salt, right? What does the fasciculata, the thickest layer, make? Sugar, cortisol, okay? What does the reticularis made? Well, those are the sex hormones, both estrogenic and androgenic like compounds, but usually a predominance of androgenic type compounds. So what does that mean? G, F, R, salt, sugar, sex. One of the students said something that I put in there. He said, the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. Salt, sugar, sex. That's the way to remember it. GFR, salt, sugar, sex. You'll never forget it. You know what they make. And uh, next one. There's your typical adrenal glands. Once again, you see there's a lot of fat surrounding them. So it's not surprising that once you peel away the fat nicely, you're going to see something that's only about four grams each. Is that in the next picture? Okay, there you go. You see a lot of fat. And the average cortex is yellow. It's yellow because there's a lot of cholesterol in there. Cholesterol is a fat. The cholesterol are the steroid precursors. is only about one millimeter thick. So your ideal theoretical adrenal cortex is about one beautiful bright yellow one millimeter ribbon that's very well demarcated from the softer, redder, more hemorrhagic medullary stuff, which is underneath. That's predominantly uh, cortex. Now, do you see that little bump on top? Even though when you lay the adrenals down, on the table, they look flat. If you cut through of them, one of them has like kind of like a... Yeah. What adrenal is that? Is that the left or the right? How do you know it's the left? The, for some reason, the left adrenal has a bump on top. You know one way to remember that? The left adrenal doesn't have to worry about the liver pushing it down, right? That's how we think of it. I don't think that's the real reason. So there you go, there's your four gram adrenal. You dissected it nicely, not very big. Next one. There's your salt, sugar, and sex. And by the way, then once you're outside of the uh, cortex and then you're into the medulla, which no longer has a glandular type thing, but a very, very vascular and maybe some ganglion looking cells, then you got your stress. So if you want to add another S, salt, sugar, sex, and stress, that's nice, but then you can't. Use the analogy, the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. Okay, so the capsule. And take a look at the top here. Uh, can, you can't make that bigger. Let's go to the next one. Now go back again. Do you see how the majority of that layer of adrenal cortex looks rather lineal? Like you took some palm leaves or aloe leaves outside, just laid them down there. That's the fasciculata, they're fascicles. Do you see how right underneath the capsule you see little round bodies? Maybe you could see them better than I do, but those are, that's the glomerulosa, the mineralocloid. Oh, yeah, you could see little glomerular structures. I'll point one out for you. You know, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. But the majority of the thickness of the adrenal cortex are these linear fascicles. And then once you get down, oh, this one doesn't have much of a reticularis, but probably here, they're not really so much linear anymore. Next one. What is hyperadrenalism? Hyperadrenalism is an increase in uh, adrenal cortical hormones. They could be any one of the uh, layers. They could be 
the mineralocorticoids, that could be the glucocorticoids, that could be the uh, sex uh, hormones. Now, the classical name for uh, an increase in the mineralocorticoids from the zona glomerulosa is Kahn's syndrome, C-O-N-N syndrome. And that's something that's going to produce an increase in mineralocorticoids, the master hormone of which is aldosterone. And I already know that you know way more about aldosterone than I do, because you probably talked about it for days in renal physiology. But aldosterone puts sodium back into the tubules. So what, whoa, excuse me, I'm really getting crazy here. Aldosterone, does it save sodium or does it, it's, it's, it's hypertension as part of the axis. So aldosterone is actually uh, not excreting sodium, but excreting potassium, okay? So the more sodium that you're saving, the higher your blood pressure gets. Okay, now Cushing syndrome which is the most common form of adrenal cortical uh, overexpression of hormone, is due to an increase in the glucocorticoids. So CAN is the increase in hyperaldosterone from the glomerulosa. Cushing is an increase in uh, the glucocorticoids from the fasciculata. And then the typical name, there's a couple of names for an increase in the hormones of the reticularis. And those are generally virilizing type syndromes. They're both in males and it's females. And they're more likely to produce uh, androgenic type effects rather than estrogenic type effects. So those are the three types of hyperadrenalism. Let's we'll go into each one. Cushing syndrome, we'll talk about that because it's the most common. Remember we showed you at the beginning a buffalo hump, a moon face, a stride, those are all classical examples. But let's throw a few more in there. We also said diabetes, we also said hirsutism, hypertension, osteoporosis, okay, central obesity, you know, which is also like diabetes, like I have. Um, so those are the clinical features of hyperadrenal corticalism, predominantly at the glucocorticoid level. Let's look at the pictures again. Moon faces, buffalo hump, striatae. These are the three big ones. These are the ones that we most often saw. We reviewed all of our steroid side effects for Upjohn Company. Next one. Cushing syndrome. So why would we have an increase of these hormones? Well, one thing is that maybe there's some reason for increase of pituitary ACTH. Like, what would you expect in the acetophilic or a basophilic adenoma? Basophilic, right? To produce excessive ACTH. Now, can you have tumors of the lung and other areas that produce ectopic ACTH-like compounds? Yeah, there's a whole variety of them, and most of them are from the lung. And uh, it's not just the endocrinologic looking tumors. Sometimes it's even the ones that look like regular squamous or adeno can pr be producing ectopic ACTH. That's another reason. What if your adrenal cortices were hyperplastic? Could that produce increase in uh, cortisol? Could also produce an increase in aldosterone as well? Sure it could. Could also produce an increase in virilizing or sex type hormones as well? Sure. What about carcinoma of the cortex? If you had an adrenal cortical carcinoma, big tumor, you know, the size of a football, could that be producing increased overall uh, hormones or cortical? It could, but remember, it's extremely, extremely rare. And I've been practicing pathology for what? I would say 40 years, but it seems like about 400. I've never seen one. Okay, so you, when you, you could probably Google uh, something that, if you want to Google a functional adrenal cortical carcinoma, you'll probably find a couple of them somewhere in the world. But everything that we talked about right now is only 10% of the reason for Cushing syndrome. The main reason is increase in exogenous steroids. And, you know, uh, real doctors, you know, what you're going to be. They always are in a bind. They know that steroids 
will very, very, very often help their patients when nothing else seems to work, especially critically ill patients, especially patients they know that they need those steroids. As they know that if they keep them on them too long, or you know they're going to have problems. Now, if if I was in the ICU and I needed steroids to keep me alive, I wouldn't worry about getting buffalo hump in three months. Okay, so it's always a decision you have to make, and that's the most common cause. Now, here's the question: We I think we discussed this yesterday. You got somebody with Cushing syndrome. You yank out their adrenal uh, adrenal glands. You got them in your hand. I told you the normal thickness of a cortex would be one millimeter, but now your cortical thickness is only one tenth of a millimeter. Is that Cushing syndrome due to exogenous steroids, or is it due to uh, endogenous increases in, let's say, ACTH? Exogenous. So, Cushing syndrome due to exogenous steroids are going to result in feedback to the pituitary to shut down the production of ACTH. And if I say TSH, you know what I'm talking about. Next one. Okay, primary hyperaldosteronism is a disease of the adrenal gland resulting in an excessive production of mineralocorticoids, which means aldosterone. Now, aldosterone retains sodium. That's part of the normal blood pressure control, remember? The um, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone access, which you probably should have tattooed somewhere, either on your back or your butt, depending on where you have more room, okay? Because that's something that really everybody has to know about. But it also excretes potassium. Okay, now, if you have a situation like a tumor or a hyperplasia, and it results in excessive production of aldosterone, patients going to be hypertensive is the main presenting sy symptom. They could be hypertensive for another reason too. Okay, next one. Why anatomically, pathologically would somebody have hot primary hyperaldosteronism? Well, maybe there's a cortical adenoma. Maybe there's just cortical hyperplasia. And there are familial types. That's relatively rare, but we have to add that to the list. Next one. Okay. Now, secondary hyperaldosteronism is basically your basic regular run-of-the-mill hypertension, isn't it? You're having decreased blood flow to the kidney, so the renin kicks in. It uh, triggers off the uh, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. result is that there's going to be a production of uh, aldosterone, and that's really a secondary type of hyperaldosterone, isn't it? Also, you should remember that pregnancy is a big, uh, uh, it's, is a, a very often associated with secondary hyperaldosteronism also. I don't know why, but I got to put that on the list. Next one. Now, the third part, we're into the sex now. We went through the G and the, we went to the F. Now we're in the R. We went through the salt, we went to the sugar. Now we're, in the we're talking about increase of hormones produced from the zona reticularis. Those are prom, predominantly sex hormones, both androgens as well as estrogenic like compounds. Now, there's a family of diseases which are congenital, which are genetic, which are due to enzyme lacks, which are due to gene mutations, which result in ineffective production of uh, cortical hormones. It could be at all levels, but now we're talking about at the reticularis level. And those are generally referred to as the adrenal genital syndrome. The original enzyme deficiency was 21-hydroxylase deficiency due to a gene defect. And babies that are born with these gene defects, that's the most common, will wind up having an increase in sex hormones. Now, they could be baby girls or they could be baby boys. Now, if a baby boy is born with it, even if it's a severe form, he might not have too much by way of uh, phenotypic or genital expression. But if a, a girl is born with uh, adrenal genital syndrome, she might have uh, genitalia which are looking a little bit more like male because when these babies are born with hyperplastic adrenals and they're having outpour of sex hormones now, 
it seems like uh, the male expression, the male hormones expressed in the female cause a greater phenotypic appearance than the opposite. Next one. So that's like a summary of it. Now, let's get to the fun part. There's an adrenal gland on the left that's cut open. Remember I told you the cortex is a bright yellow ribbon and the medulla is red and hemorrhagic? Well, let's say that you have a tumor of the adrenal and the tumor looks exactly that same level of brightness as the cortex. Is that adrenal cortical tumor or is that adrenal medullary tumor? Okay, but let me ask you this. Let's say that you had that same nodule there in the adrenal, only it was red, exactly like the medulla, rather than not yellow like the cortex. Would that be a medullary tumor or a cortical tumor? Yeah, it's just common sense, isn't it? So you may or may not know this, but the most common tumor of the adrenal medulla is something called a pheochromocytoma. So if I told you that was adrenal cortical adenoma, by the way, they're very, very common. I would say probably in about, oh, 10, 20% of all autopsies, you'll see little thickenings of the adrenal cortex. Some of them may be functional and would have produced some increased uh, steroid at some level effect, but most of them are really non-functional. But let's say that same tumor was now red rather than yellow. You would say, even before you put it in the microscope, well, we've got a pheochromocytoma here, don't we? What is that adrenal there in the northeast? Let's say that you put that ruler there over it. You looked at the cortices. You go, yeah, they're about a millimeter. That's normal. But then what would you call the adrenal right underneath it? That's more than a millimeter, isn't it? So that's diffuse hyperplasia. So adrenal cortical hyperplasia would involve basically the whole cortex of being thickened more than a millimeter, maybe two or three. Whereas an adenoma would cause an increase of cortical substance usually in one focal place. And you know, there, let's say for all practical purposes, all the adenomas, of course by definition are benign. Adrenal cortical carcinomas are rare and functional ones are something you'll never see. Next one. What about the opposite? What about the lack of adrenal cortical hormones? Okay, why would it happen? Well, it could happen acutely, or it could happen chronically, or it could happen because of controlling influences from the pituitary. So, there is a entity called adrenal crisis in which you have a sudden acute shutdown of adrenal hormones. And there's another entity which we call chronic, which is a slow insidious disease. It may not really be expressed in terms of lower hormones until you're an adult. Of course, everybody kind of knows that John F. Kennedy had Addison's disease, right? And Addison's disease is to the adrenal, is what Hashimoto's disease is to the thyroid. It's an autoimmune adrenal cortical itis. Okay, so if you saw a lot of lymphocytes scattered throughout the thyroid in Hashimoto's, what do you think you'd see in the adrenal cortex with adrenals gland? The same thing. And of course, let's say that your pituitary shut down for whatever reason, you know, tumor, radiation, all these things we talked about yesterday, would that result in adrenal shutdown as well? Of course, because you're not getting any ACTH. Next one. So let's talk about the primary acute. One of them is a syndrome which is called Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. It's a sudden shot, shutdown of adrenals, usually following massive life-threatening infections like meningococcemia, staph, H flu. It's usually associated with septic shock. Okay, that's one reason. Another thing uh, to remember is that another type of acute adrenal shutdown is something that you're going to have to worry about every day. And it's when you have your patients on steroids and you know it's now time to withdraw the steroids and let those adrenals function on their own because the more steroids you're giving them, the more you're suppressing that cortex. So eventually, if you're treating your patients with steroid for life-threatening illnesses, you want to eventually get them off it so that when the life-threatening event is gone, so they could go and use their own adrenal. Well, if you just stop the steroids, the adrenals are going to shut down. It's a very, very serious disease. 
That's why you're going to learn these little formulas for gradual withdrawal or gradual with a weaning of patients from steroids. And there are formulas for it, and I don't know them. But generally speaking, I know a few patients on steroids. One of my pathologist friends was on it for an autoimmune disease, and he showed me the formula for withdrawal. He just would have to take like a half of that dose for a couple weeks more and then half of that for a couple more weeks. It's a gradual kind of a thing. Now, also, uh, you can have a primary acute adrenal deficiency following uh, difficult delivery. You can get waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome following a delivery. What if the patient's on anticoagulants? Well, maybe those adrenals are bleeding. Okay, that would be another reason if you're suddenly bleeding into your adrenals. And last but not least, uh, patients with DIC are allowed to bleed anywhere, including adrenals. So that's a differential diagnosis of primary acute adrenal failure. Now we'll talk about reasons for the adrenals to fail chronically or slowly. Primary chronic, okay? Autoimmune adrenalitis is like autoimmune thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune disease. You can detect antibodies against elements of the adrenal. It's called Addison's disease. Uh, infections can also, gener of the adrenal also can do it. You might remember that for some reason, a lot of these systemic fungal diseases, like histoplasmosis especially, uh, we just love to go to the adrenals. I don't know why. I want to tell you another tip as well. Maybe uh, I don't. I don't know what the reason for it is. I've wondered about this my whole life. But when uh, a pathologist is doing an autopsy on somebody that has lung cancer, and it looks like all the scans were negative before the patient died, and it looks like it's just limited to one area, he is going to examine those adrenal glands very, very, very carefully. Because very often lung cancer of all types, small cell, non-small cell, they just love to go to the adrenals even before they might even go to the lymph nodes. Isn't that amazing? The adrenal glands are magnets for metastatic lung cancer. And uh, Finally, there's some genetic disorders. Now, I wrote some things down here in the lecture notes. You could expand them if you want. But, you know, here we are talking about uh, Addison's disease. If they have a question about Addison's disease, they're not going to ask you, you know, what are the antibodies or, you know. They're going to ask you, a patient comes in with this, this, and this. And they're re relatively nonspecific symptoms. But I want you to read that. I would rather not read it to you. I'd rather make you work for that because when you work for it, that's how you're going to draw the line between the disease entities and the classical clinical presentation scenarios. Next one. Neoplasms, very simple. We already saw the adrenal cortical adenoma. That would be a big thick thing that looks exactly like adrenal cortex, only it's focal. And rather than it being a one millimeter ribbon, it's, you know, a two centimeter ball. Okay, there's one there, there's one there, and there's one there. And the one on the right is just a little bit more vascular or hemorrhagic than the other two, but basically it's bright yellow. Everything in the body that's bright yellow grossly is fat. In this case, it's cholesterol. Next one. Okay. I don't know why I put this up here, and there's, but I just wanted to remind you once again, I should, probably should have put this somewhere else. You know, there's your glomeruli in the northwest, real glomeruli, looking more like those little round bodies in the glomerulosa. There's a palm frond showing fascicles down there. Okay, and I don't know, do they have reticulated pythons in El Yunque, or is that strictly? Okay, good, that means we can go. That's a reticulated python. And re whereas uh, fasciculae are basically linear, reticulated things are like diamond shaped. They're like more like matted. Now, why did I put that there? But I just wanted to show you that no matter what level you're in, it's just a yellow grossly. And for example, that cortical adenoma there, it could very well be totally non-functional, not produce any increase in hormone, or it could produce increases in hormone from any one of those three layers. 
but the most likely layer would be I'm asking the uh, buzzards most likely layer fasciculata cortisol okay next one another nice adrenal cortical adenoma beautiful okay that's the same one I think I showed you only now it's a little oh take a look how on the left here the tail of the sperm you can see those one millimeter bright yellow things well demarcated from the underlying bright red or jelly red uh, medulla you see how that nice road is that nice yellow road on each side and in the middle you have your median strip growing all the trees and look at the uh, proliferation or the tumor you could tell is from the cortex rather than medulla but what if that tumor on the end was just as red as the median strip there on the on the left it would probably be a tumor of the medulla wouldn't it next one and there's an adrenal cortical car carcinoma there's nothing weird about it it's just big and it's not yellow because it's not well differentiated like an adeno should be so if it doesn't look like uh, an adenoma doesn't have the same color of an adenoma it's probably not gonna behave like an adenoma and make cortical hormones that's why most of the, almost all of the carcinomas are oh yeah you could probably detect uh, compounds in them if you do special stains but they're not going to result in hyperadrenalism syndromes next one okay you know what uh, let's stop here you know there's only a couple more things left on medulla and a cup maybe like I don't know what how many PowerPoints are left there Mario about 10 or something I mean, oh, we're both also diabetes on here, so let's stop here. Let's call it a day. We've all been working hard. Um, I don't have anything more to say. I, um, I, I guess I could be accused of not listening to you enough, so if somebody wants to have something to say, <laughs> could you say it to everyone possibly, or did you feel like everything I said cleared up everything and we'll just start a new day tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll finish off the tail end of endocrine, we're going to do something that is criminal, which is only, you know, two hours on diabetes, which is, you, we should probably be doing two weeks on diabetes. You'll be doing your whole life on diabetes. And then uh, there'll probably be some time tomorrow to talk to the buzzards, too. So let's do the closing song. The closing song is a very special song. It's by Brian Adams, it's one of my favorite songs. It's a love song. But if you translate what he's saying in terms of words, it could also be a prayer. So some of the most inspirational love songs are also prayers. And this is going to be Everything I Do by Brian Adams. Uh, see you uh, tomorrow, everybody.
rock on you buzzards and you might want to kind of remember that everything you do in your life you should do for somebody see you tomorrow